Uh, thank you all for joining. We're going to jump right in at 2 p.m. on the dot Eastern time because we have a jam-packed agenda, which we always like to do. Uh, my name is Terry Martin with NAPSIC Foundation. I want to thank you for joining us today. We're going to get started with our next installment and in our prep tech talk webinar series in just a moment with from state to national damage assessment collection and coordination. But first, we have just a few logistical items before we get started. So please note that the recording will be, that we are recording. Um, it will be made available after this session. If you register, you'll receive an email that the webinar materials are available. So for that reason, and due to the number in attendance, your lines have been muted. Uh, for questions, we'll be using the Q&A feature within Zoom. We would definitely like to encourage you to use that. So feel free throughout the entire session as questions come to mind to type those in. Panelists will be typing answers when they can, when they're not speaking. And if there is time at the end, uh, we'll select a handful of questions to cover live. Additionally, I have Kevin Kay and Jared Doak from the NABSIG team with me. They're gonna be monitoring the chat and available for general questions as well. So Kevin, Jared, if anything um, pops up, cause I can't see everything with my monitor, please chime in and let me know. So, I want to uh, start off with just a little brief review of our agenda. So we are really grateful to have a couple of amazing speakers today that will be sharing their work and knowledge with us on this incredibly important and relevant topic of damage assessments. It's certainly a critical task post-disaster that jurisdictions need to get right. We hope that you'll all leave with some valuable resources that will help you and your organizations just be better prepared to conduct damage assessments in the future. So we will first hear from Daniel Stolb from Oregon's Department of Emergency Management, followed by Melody O'Hanlon um, with FEMA. Um, and then we'll wrap up with a Q&A if there is time at the end, along with our usual calls to action. Um, and I'll do a more formal introduction uh, before each of their sections. Um, so moving along, I wanna just, First talk about NAPSIG, uh, who we are and our goal for hosting sessions like this. So for those of you who are new to our organization, we are a 501c3 nonprofit. We have a national network of over 20,000 members, public safety and jazz practitioners alike, representing all levels of government, the private sector and academia. We were formed almost 20 years ago. I had to update that as an alliance between a number of prominent national associations, some of which you see here, and we've evolved into a formal organization over the course of that time. Our mission is to improve the safety, resilience, and well being of our communities and to improve government and non governmental organization responses to chronic and emergent public safety threats and incidents. And we do this through these three pillars advancing the use of geospatial fostering adoption of geospatial tools and best practices, bridging the gaps across public safety agencies and disciplines. And then practically speaking, how we do this, how we fulfill our mission um, is largely through defining and propagating the consistent use of best practices. And we do this through the development of national guidelines and standards. And we work to um, encourage and foster collaboration. And we do this through regional exercises and simulations, which serve to further validate or update guidance based on those activities. And then additionally, through education training, like we're doing today, we aim to build the capacity of the community, sharing examples of great work and lessons learned from locals like Daniel and amplifying the availability of resources from our federal partners like FEMA. So finally, we work to transfer that knowledge and skills to the community. And we do this through direct help, video and written tutorials, toolkits, and so on. So I mentioned that we have about 20,000 members, mostly in the US, but certainly across the globe. And you can see from the map who has registered for the webinar today, at least those we were able to map based on zip code. And this is a pretty good cross section of the country and as expected a high percentage of emergency management due to the topic. But we are excited to see other disciplines, which is really good as we try and bridge the gap and work towards cross discipline and agency information sharing and coordination. So with that, I am super excited to introduce an EMGIS rock star who is going to get us kicked off, he didn't know I was going to say that, with a local perspective of damage assessments. Daniel Stolb has been involved with geographic information systems since 2006. 
starting with his career working at, with the Oregon Department of Forestry, then worked in local government for the Douglas County Planning Department until transitioning to the Oregon Office of Emergency Management, where he is the GIS program coordinator. He is also currently the co-lead for the National States Geographic Information Council, or NISGIC, Geospatial Preparedness Interest Group, and a recipient of the 2020 Special Achievement in GIS Award from ESRI. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Daniel. All right, thanks, Terry. Just a quick confirmation that you're able to see my slide deck okay? Yes. All right, uh, so to go ahead and get started here, I'll be talking with you all today about our damage assessment project initiative and kind of how it came to be, how we're utilizing it, etc. So really kind of the basics for this particular project was to really build something that utilizes existing technology out there. Uh, obviously, for those of you that are involved in emergency management, doing a lot of just-in-time things, you don't really have a lot of time to build something from scratch. So how are we able to take advantage of software solutions that are out there, easy to get up and running, and able to be maintained consistently moving forward? Um, you now, really, when we talk about damage assessment, the components that I'll be walking uh, you all through today really relate more to the homes and businesses aspects. I know that there are some other solutions out there, which Melody will be talking about a little bit later, dealing with the public assistance side of the house. Really, what we wanted to do was gather information consistently using GIS. Now, really, a lot of the information that we're collecting here is location-based data. So how are we able to collect that information consistently? And then to then do something with that data, right? Now, we collect a lot of points out there. How are we able to then present that information that helps inform our leadership in order to make decisions moving forward? And really, the, the last piece of this particular project was to build something that's easy to use. You all know that when you're designing and building solutions, if it's not easy for folks to utilize, they're just not going to use it, and especially during times of crisis. So what were some of the, the reasons for why we did this particular project? Well. It's critical data that is gathered during an event. Um, we really need to also present and share this information with partners. Uh, we want to have a common format for that information. And as you all know, there are a lot of discrepancies or redundant efforts that are being done, especially in the damage assessment space. So how do we get it into a single source solution to where we're contributing data onto a common platform into a single data service? It also helps us to understand what's being reported. If we're having people enter in the data consistently, then we understand how that information is being collected. We know what it means. And it also helps to streamline our reporting process to FEMA for disaster funding requests. Now here at the state, we have delegated some responsibility for the locals to collect their own damage assessment information, review and approve that information, and then we're the pass through to FEMA for making that disaster declaration request. So let's talk a little bit of history about how we've used GIS for damage assessment leading up to the development of this program here. Um, so annually, we have a conference called Oregon Prepared. And uh, back in 2016, we held a little session here to figure out, are we able to utilize GIS to do and conduct damage assessments out in the field? So this particular uh, conference, we ended up having folks go to site-specific locations. So we had designated some talkers or people that held a clipboard that had information about a particular set of damage. And participants downloaded collector uh, for ArcGIS on their smart device. And they went out, we grouped people into 30 different teams and collected information about each of these little properties that were scattered around here. Um, there were some public assistant impacts that were designated as a part of it. And then we used the old operations dashboard template. Those of you that have been working with ArcGIS lines uh, for a while will recognize that. But same concepts apply here. Uh, folks went out into the field, collected information, the data was then visualized in a map and a dashboard that depicted kind of what was happening out there. Let's fast forward a couple of years to our major event that we had uh, 
I guess I can't say somewhat recently, it's been a couple of years, uh, but our historic uh, wildfires that we had in 2020. There were multiple jurisdictions that were impacted by this particular event. They were utilizing GIS to some degree with multiple partners generating different data sets showing what the disaster impacts were. So we have some information here coming from FEMA's geospatial damage assessments that were conducted, and this was the Almeda fire. We had Red Cross going out and doing some damage assessments for Douglas County, and then we had uh, damage assessments collected by our state fire marshal partners uh, for the Beachy Creek fire here. So lots and lots of different data sets were collected. We had in total eight different jurisdictions impacted by these wildfire events, but seldom did any of the schema match. So when we're taking a look at the data and trying to determine at the end of the day, what are our numbers? You now, how many destroyed, damaged homes were there? It was hard to decipher what that was because folks were doing it inconsistently. It was mapped in different fields, different data was on display for that. There was a lack of that data standardization out there, which led to us having to take quite a bit of time to sift through and filter through the data to figure out what were the actual numbers that were being reported. And there was also a missed opportunity here in that no uh, business damage information was collected as a part of this. And especially since the 2020 wildfires, when you're looking at taking a look at the recovery efforts and getting those businesses back up and running again, kind of a missed opportunity to really see how many businesses were actually damaged, destroyed, or impacted by these events. So a lot of stuff was happening out there, a lot of different data. The good news is, you know, GIS data sets, you're able to throw it into a map, but there were some missed opportunities in that we didn't have data consistently across the state here. So how do we look to address that particular issue? Um, first off, it starts with kind of having a landing page. Where do people go to find out information about this particular solution? So we built and designed a damage assessment hub site that talks about the Oregon Damage Assessment Project. Now, this is a spot where folks can go. It's a public facing page, kind of a landing page of sorts, to where folks can go and take a look at the user guide form documentation, but it also provides kind of a behind the scenes access that folks can sign into to see additional details that pertain to them. Uh, for this particular solution, we're utilizing uh, Survey123 and Quick Capture for that consistent data collection element. Um, but on the back end, you know, we're using more of the hub sites, the pages for a hub site, and then dashboards to visualize that information and some quick apps as well, which I'll show you as we walk through this page. So taking a look at the public facing hub site as it stands right now, we have the damage assessment uh, main link here, and I'll post that to, oh, if I can get some folks to share that on the main screen there. Um, so we have links to the project documents, which include the reference guide. So this is literally a walkthrough on how to utilize this particular solution. So if I'm needing to deploy this for my jurisdiction, I can read through and know and understand what all of this means, what's the purpose, what information is being collected as a part of these steps, and what the steps are. You know, uh, what information are we collecting as a part of that? What's kind of a recommendation for the team composition? And kind of a screenshot for how each of these things look. And as we scroll down here, we'll walk through the process on how do I access the data? How do I collect the data for my jurisdiction? And how do I review it? So there are elements that we've built here that walk from, you know, need to get boots on the ground to snap a photo, collect some information about this particular property, clear through, I'm working back at the EOC, need to be able to review and approve these damage assessments for the state and partners to be able to do something with that information. The other link that we have here is our form design template. So this walks you through all of the questions that we're asking for each of our forms here. So we have a quick capture solution here, which is really very basic information. You're picking a jurisdiction, you're picking a damage category, you're snapping a photo and moving on. Kind of that windshield assessment that's commonly talked about there. Then we have a secured uh, 
individual assistance form or an IA form, this is where you're deploying kind of that larger team to go and collect additional details about the property. And then if a jurisdiction wants it, we do have a public facing form to where they can actually embed this form on their website, have folks self-report damages, and then there will be a review and approve process on all of the damage assessments that are conducted. So a couple of ways that data can get into the system there. So really that's kind of what is on our main hub site here. So when we take a look at securing information on this uh, particular solution, we are utilizing the ArcGIS Online framework to grant access to do certain things on the secured side of this hub site. Um, so we've split everybody into two different groups. So each jurisdiction will have two groups. I know there's a lot of states that have a lot of counties out there. In our case, 36 counties, two groups per county. You can do the math there. Um, but we have one group specifically for field workers. Those are the people that are going out and conducting assessments. And then one group for the damage assessment reviewers. These are people that are reviewing and approving for their jurisdiction. So we have these uh, groups set up to where they can be joined from any organization. Um, so if we have folks that already have an ArcGIS online account, we can invite them in. Otherwise, if they need an account, uh, we are using hub community accounts to uh, add people into the system to allow them to do certain things within this platform. So as I mentioned earlier, groups in ArcGIS online allow for folks from a jurisdiction or representing a jurisdiction to do certain things. So the first one we'll talk about is the field workers group. So this is what folks will use to go out and collect information for their jurisdiction. Uh, it provides them access to a secured page on that hub site. So they'll sign in. And once they sign in, they'll be presented with the forms and training screen. The forms and training screen includes a QR code that they will scan to their device to download the survey to their device to start collecting information. But also on that page, I have some recorded YouTube links that show, hey, how do I do this particular thing? How do I scan a QR code and get it onto my device? How do I start collecting information for my particular jurisdiction? So it walks folks through, they're able to use this as kind of that training aspect to go out and collect that information. So if we go back to our hub site, I have signed in here. I click on that forms and training page. Here I see the survey templates, and these are also hyperlinked as well. So if I want to go and I collect information for my particular jurisdiction, I can also click on this link, which will open up the web version of the survey, and I can start collecting information for that particular property. And then the instructional guides, as I mentioned earlier, these are just YouTube links that point to how to do a certain thing on their device. So the reviewers group is a little bit different. So these are folks that are reviewing and approving those damage assessments that are conducted for their particular jurisdiction. And because we have things broken out by jurisdiction, they're gonna have access to their jurisdiction's tab on the hub site. So when they sign in, let's say I'm representing Douglas County, I sign in, I'm going to see a Douglas County link on the top. And that tells me everything I need to know about the data for my jurisdiction. Um, it includes some key components in here, the, uh, all of the collected data. So I can download that information if I want to, to a spreadsheet. So a lot of folks are very non-technical and like to kind of take a look at things from a spreadsheet perspective also gives me an attachment viewer. I can have kind of a focused view on all of the images that were captured from the damage assessment. Also gives us the ability to uh, review and approve damage assessments for my jurisdiction. And as a part of this particular solution here, uh, when we were going out and pitching it to our partners, uh, we had representatives from the Department of Land Conservation and Development indicate, hey, we have a substantial damage assessment project uh, program to where we also send folks out, but can we hop in on your particular solution? So 
we actually started with the FEMA individual assistance template and added in our organized, that pun was intended there, uh, to add in some additional information that was relevant for our state, uh, for our particular initiative here. So we have a review and approved dashboard specifically for uh, reviewing damages that are in the floodplain. So floodplain managers and delegates have a opportunity to review and approve their component of the damage assessment for that property. So kind of a quick overview of what the reviewers group page looks like. Here, I'm signed in, pretend that I'm representing Klamath County here, and I can see all of the damage assessment collected data here. I can view the details for that, kind of like a secured view of an open data page to where I can click on and download this particular information as necessary. So I can download it in a wide variety of different formats. Give my computer a little bit of time to process here. But I can download it in all of these different files. Also, I can plug this into my own apps. If I'm using ArcGIS online, I can throw that into any of my particular apps that I've built and want to interact with. Likewise, as I scroll down here, I'm going to see information uh, from the attachment viewer. So this shows all of the attachments that were collected and I can click on any one of these. It'll highlight in the map here and I can see the details, including the survey one, two, three submittal that was done. I can also take a look at the damage assessments at a glance. I can filter by date if I want to. And it shows me the numbers that are important. So when we're taking a look at damages from a statewide perspective, destroyed and major damaged homes are important, and then major and minor damaged businesses are uh, the components that we like to look at for business damages. And it also shows us the, where things are at in the process. So what ones have been completed, what ones have not been completed. And what we mean by that is, has the local jurisdiction reviewed and approved that damage assessment record? And then on the very bottom of the page are links to the review dashboards. So to review and approve a damage assessment, they're gonna go into this particular dashboard here, which will display all of the damage assessments that were conducted for their jurisdiction. We have a quick how-to guide on the right-hand side here that talks to how to use this particular dashboard but in general, we have all of these damage assessments listed on the left-hand side of the screen. If it has kind of this pink background and the QA, QC completed, no, that means that it has not been reviewed yet. So if we take a look at these, we'll see kind of information about the property type, uh, this damage category, what was the report type? So in this case, they used a quick capture form, who submitted it when it was last reviewed, and then the QA, QC completed. When I click on that record, that's gonna zoom into that location on the map here. And then it's also gonna bring about an update form. So this is using an embedded uh, survey one, two, three here, opening it up in edit mode to where they can make adjustments as necessary for that particular record. And you now selecting the property type, whatever information they may have back at home base that they didn't have when they went out into the field. And once they're done, they'll hit the yes and then submit, which will then review and approve it for their jurisdiction. So we tried to put this in a way that is easy for non-technical people to use. Now, a lot of folks through COVID, right, have been utilizing online surveys. So how can we get it to a point to where a couple of clicks and I can get to that information that I need to do, making the review process a lot easier for me, especially as a non-technical person. Up on the top here, you'll also notice that we can adjust the categories. So if we want to filter things out based upon a damage category, we can do that up at the top as well. The other link that you'll see here is the floodplain substantial damage assessment. And it's a very similar view to what we had earlier. You'll notice this says substantial damage assessment review, but there's different data that's on display in here. The first thing you'll notice is 
the floodplain boundaries are shown in this map here. So that when I'm going out and I'm reviewing stuff for my jurisdiction, I can see where the property is in relation to the floodplain and have a more informed perspective as when I'm filling out this information. So there are some key components in here. Now location information is set. They're not able to adjust or modify that information, but they can fill out information specifically about that substantial damage assessment. So if they now know what the market value of the structure is, and they can then calculate some estimates, which are utilized to then determine whether or not it's considered substantially damaged. So some key pieces here, it's all fed from the same data set, uh, but we're involving a couple of different processes here. The other component are for our partners. So we have a state partners tab. This is like the followers group from the hub site. So this includes all of our response partners that we have in addition to our federal partners. So region 10 has access to this page that talks to all of the approved records that are done. There's a dashboard in here that talks to where things are at for each county within the state, the total number of assessments that are conducted uh, for business and home damages, and then kind of that statewide overview of where things are at and what the damage uh, looks like from a state perspective. So a way for us to be able to share very quickly, very easily, a lot of information, uh, but have kind of this single source solution, right? Folks are going in, they're entering in this information consistently using Quick Capture Survey 123, and then the review and approve process is accessed via that hub site. They sign in, they go into a dashboard, make those adjustments as necessary, and then our partners can access that information via the hub site or the groups that they have been added into. So kind of an all-encompassing way that folks are able to collect and gather and review and approve this information consistently for the entire state. With that said, uh, certainly would welcome any questions that folks have. Feel free to enter uh, Q&A stuff in the chat. Uh, you can access that main damage assessment hub site that's been posted out there by Kevin. And then my contact information is in here as well. Feel free to reach out if you have questions. I certainly would welcome any folks that uh, would like to learn more about this solution or have some ideas or thoughts or uh, concepts on that. So I will go ahead and pass things over to our next presenter today. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. I appreciate that so much. The amount of initiatives that come out of your state, you would think you had a small army working with you. Um, but I appreciate how you customize off the shelf solutions to make them work for you. In particular, uh, you worked to ensure data collection was standardized. And I know that was music to every GISer's ears. And we all know how much decision makers like conflicting numbers, right? Um, and then creating a one-stop shop with templates and training is also another great takeaway. So if you want something adopted, in addition to making sure that the data collected is useful for your stakeholders, you also need to give them all the tools like help guides and videos to assist them in their implementation. So uh, very good. Thank you so much. Um, yes, uh, as you said, please put your questions in the Q&A. If we have time at the end, uh, we'll select a few and ask Daniel to answer them live. Otherwise, I'm sure he'll be diligently answering them, typing them into the Q&A. Awesome. So with that, um, I would like to introduce our next presenter, a damage assessment technology guru at FEMA. She also didn't know I was going to say that. Melody O'Hanlon is a project manager in the Recovery Technology Programs Division in the FEMA Office of Response and Recovery. She currently supports the Field Assessment and Collections Tools, or FACT system, which hosts application suites for five different program and mission areas including the Preliminary Damage Assessment Program suite of applications. Prior to joining FEMA in 2017, Melody spent 11 years in software development as a contractor for the United States Coast Guard. We are so grateful to have you, Melody, and members of your team with us today. Are you able to share your slides, or am I just not seeing them yet? No, I had not hit share yet. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> Perfect. I, they look great. I will go ahead and turn it over to you. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, hello. <laughs> um, 
I am going to speak with you about um, how to streamline, how FEMA can help streamline the damage assessment process using your data gathered with GIS tools, like Daniel was just talking about. Um, but first, I want to give you a little bit of insight into the GIS tech that FEMA uses for PDAs. Um, we're a little bit of a black box, I know, um, because we must strictly follow security protocols on many levels to maintain our authority to operate. Um, and according to our confidentiality, integrity, and availability classifications, we're quite locked down. Um, and currently, we're only available to FEMA personnel. Um, so I just wanted to make sure you understand that, but I do wanna show you some of our tools. Um, for the PDA tool suite, um, it's, it's a pretty broad tool suite. Um, and our goals are to develop tools that are non-GIS professional friendly, like Daniel was talking about before, um, while providing flexibility for those who are GIS professionals. Um, we are trying to meet the mission needs of both the individual assistance and public assistance programs. And we wanna to develop tools that are flexible enough to meet the needs of all 10 regions, while also providing FEMA headquarters um, with the tools for analysis and reporting at the higher levels and reporting to Congress and things that, that they need. Um, so we do have our tool set seems to be growing all of the time, I will say that. Um, we've got five different surveys. Um, we've piloted quick capture and are now working to integrate that into our whole um, enterprise solution. Uh, we've got field maps has been piloted and can be used. And we have dashboards and review tools. Um, and then the, the crowning glory is sort of our custom reporting application that applies all of the various factors that inform the, all the algorithms for estimating costs for an event. And I'll just take a moment and show you the tools now. So this is one of our, um, or this is our individual assessment PDA operational dashboard. We also have a dashboard for the public assistance side of things. You can see there, while individual assistance is concerned with the number of destroyed major and minor, our public assistance folks are focused on um, categories of work, of course. We have what we call our PDA review tool. Um, and this is where maybe an analyst can do the meat of their work. Um, you can pull all the different kinds of imagery in to this tool as needed. Um, if CAP has flown, you can pull that in. Um, any number of things, there's the oblique viewer, you can do the before and after. Um, all of the, the cool analysis stuff is here um, and as well as editing. Our folks can edit any points that they need to as they come in. Um, and this is our reporting application. Um, again, we've got reports for both IA and PA. Um, and we can report on things in a variety of different ways. Um, you can see we've got charts and counts and um, you know, raw data, as well as the rolled up data and the cost estimates. Um, and there are a lot of complex algorithms that go into that. Um, that are running on, on the back end all the time. And we have the ability to export those as well. So that's really, you know, sort of the end goal. People, folks are out there using Survey123 or Quick Capture or, you know, and even doing um, remote assessments via the review tool and getting that data in there so that we can see exactly this kind of information. A lot of this, um, I will tell you, is from our test system, so I wasn't showing real data. Um, these are some of our public assistance reports. So we have a number of options right now for streamlining. Um, obviously, you heard Daniel talk about some of that. Um, Region 10 has access to the Oregon tools. Um, but again, like the, the most streamlined would be also to get that data into the, the FEMA preliminary damage assessment system. Um, anyone can assess access, excuse me, the preliminary damage assessment templates from FEMA.gov. And I'll show you that over here. Um, I, there's a link there for it. 
Um, if you click the, the digital damage surveys, you can pop right down there. They're downloadable in XLS format. Um, and that way you'll have the data formats that are absolutely required. And just as Daniel said, if there are questions, additional questions that are important to your jurisdiction, you can add them, you can customize that as long as then we can get back the required um, fields for fact system. Um, we can import a file geodatabase from any GIS. And I do want to, I mean, I'm going to show you um, a couple of uses um, in the last year ish. But first, how do you share IDA in initial damage assessment data with FEMA? Um, so again, we can accept the geospatial data sets from our partners. Um, and there is this fact sheet that kind of details everything. But essentially, if you can provide a file geodatabase or that data set to your regional um, preliminary damage assessment coordinator, we can upload that into fact for validation and records management and reporting. So how does this work? So you hand off your initial damage data set to your FEMA PDA coordinator. Um, and we're going to stuff that into fact. <laughs> and we have this tool that we call the external data validation tool. Um, and all of the points come in there. And that is where our FEMA personnel can review, um, edit if need be. They can pull in all of the imagery, take a look at the photos that have been supplied with the data set um, and make determinations or go out in the field and take a look at things. Um, and then as soon as they have determined that, yes, this looks great, I agree with this assessment, they will mark it valid and reviewed and it gets pulled over into what we call the authoritative feature service um, and thence into the authoritative database for PDAs. And you can get the fancy report then. So one use recently of the external data validation tool was with the state of Florida. Last fall, Florida was able to provide IDA data to region two, which the region then used to validate the damages and speeding, speeding the declaration process. As a matter of fact, um, it, at least for one jurisdiction, we knew that within 30 hours of um, Ida, Ida, not Ida, in 30 hours of landfall, they had a declaration um, in place. So as FEMA personnel reviewed photos and details, they were able to edit, mark records as reviewed and valid, and send them over to the authoritative um, database and run those cost estimate reports. And those cost estimate reports are what um, inform the regional administrator's validation and recommendation, or ARVAR, that goes to the president. Um, in Montana last year, we piloted the use of field maps, which was a little bit new. So uh, we were able to get initial damage assessment data from Montana, um, and we loaded that into FACT, um, and it was available via the desktop tools. You can see here the photo attachment viewer, um, and then you, they could also look at it via the um, data validation tools. But we had a couple of um, regions who really wanted to be able to have that data out in the field on a mobile device. So we made it so that they could also see that in field maps, um, and then they could do their field assessments with that data in front of them and doing exactly the same process, but on a much um, smaller scale um, mobile app saying, yep, I review that, yep, that's that looks good, I concur with that damage, and it went directly into the authoritative data then. You can see here, there's another view of our external data validation tool. So the future, you know, it that sounds all a little clunky right now because we're an enterprise setup um, we've got authority to operate, all kinds of security things we have to follow. Um, we're locked down. We'd like to, and the, so it's a manual process for you to be able to share data with FEMA. Um, but we are moving 
in a good direction. So our future is to be able to automate that sharing of IDA data into the FACT external validation tool. Um, obviously the biggest advantage to sharing that data is that it speeds up the damage assessment process and therefore the declaration process and you're getting help to your communities faster. Um, we've got plans for how to further use our tech further use of our technology so that we can expedite the process even more. Um, we're looking at the possibility of an SLTT partner facing portal. So with a way to utilize that reporting application in the future um, so that you also have access to that. Um, so there are definite plans. Um, and I think you know, we can bring some of these into fruition in the shorter term and others of them will be um, a bit further out, but not too far. And I think I must have talked really fast because <laughs> that's it. Oh my goodness, amazing. Um, <laughs> that was so incredibly informative. So, you know, as I mentioned in the intro, one of our goals is to help share valuable resources. Um, you know, we understand how incredibly busy this community is in particular. So, you know, we, we hope that through forums like this, we can save you all time by bringing this type of content, right, in, in like one place. Um, and you're right, it can sometimes feel like our federal partners are a little bit of a black box. So it was interesting, you know, in our conversations leading up to this webinar, I appreciated learning what FEMA was doing on the back end with this data, using all the same tools we are using. And I'm sure, you know, folks on the webinar felt the same also, I just love the direction you're all headed. Uh, so great job by you and your team. We have, I actually uh, believe we have a couple minutes for questions. Kevin, was are you monitoring? Was there any questions that we could pose and get answered live to put you on the spot? Yeah, so uh, Daniel answered a handful of questions so folks that go in there and see the ones that have already been answered. So appreciate that. And of course, we'll provide those answers with the recording. Uh, some of the open questions include um, to you, Melody, uh, how are the cost estimates developed? So there are uh, algorithms that are developed in the at the headquarters uh, PDA, basically the recovery front office, um, the individual assessment program, um, the public assistance programs, and um, there are a number of factors for individual assistance, things like insurance, of course. Um, I believe those are publicly available. Um, if not, like you can certainly get those from your uh, PDA regional coordinators. Um, there is actually a, like a spreadsheet version of those that you can plug numbers into. Right. Um, and I I think we hear this question all the time because we have a robust uh, urban search and rescue community out there, but can a urban search and rescue rapid assessment data uh, be used as a stand-in for an initial assessment for the FEMA FACS system? Yeah, we've had some conversations back and forth um, with USAR um, and the response side of FEMA, um, and those have definitely been used to help inform PDAs is my understanding, um, but uh, they don't have exactly the, the same schema, the same amount of data that would allow you to get uh, to a cost estimate with only that, um, but they can definitely inform the PDAs and, and shorten the amount of data that might need to be uh, collected. Great. Um... I think that's all the open questions. And Daniel, uh, I think it's important for you to share with the, the rest of the group um, the idea of damage categories, because everyone always deals with uh, how do we classify damage? Uh, one person thinks it's something else. So I think uh, if you could share how you do that in Oregon. Yeah, well, you know, clearly a lot of it is FEMA guidance that's out there. There's the PDA pocket guide that we're linking to on our, our user guide. But one of the things that I neglected to mention earlier in my talk was when we're rolling this stuff out and we do annual refreshers on this information is we have regional coordinators that represent or are kind of our network out to our uh, counties out there. So they're holding regular training sessions on this particular solution. 
And as a part of this training session, they're going through and talking about, this is what a damage assessment is. This is what all of the different categories for individual assistance are. This is what the PA categories are so that you understand what the alphabet soup of A through G is, right? Um, but actually going through some visuals and showing them this is an example of a destroyed category. This is an example of what minor damage looks like and actually giving kind of a de facto quiz to the audience and having them you know, indicate okay, here's the image, what do you guys think? And then having them kind of have that interactive conversation. Uh, we're very fortunate that one of our regional coordinators actually came from FEMA because we love to big borrow and steal from people. So uh, one of our uh, mitigation recovery coordinators actually used to work at Region 10. So, you know, being able to kind of present this information in a way, have that interactive opportunity, uh, but also give folks you know, a way to collect this information in a way that's easy to read and understand. Those categories, yeah, they can get a little bit hinky, but remember that there's kind of that review process. So if you're out in the field, you think it's one thing, and then after looking further, because they're collecting images as a part of that, you can take a look at it and say, no, actually this should be like a minor uh, category versus a major category. Um, one of the other things that I didn't mention either is on our photo capture part of this, especially with the survey one, two, three form, we actually have categories of photos. So, you know, show us the site identification photo, show us from the curb if one exists, show us the close up image. So we're kind of formatting a little bit the views of the property so that we can kind of have a consistent way that that information is collected as well. So trying to get to a point to where you know, things are collected consistently, we're able to kind of have this dialogue back and forth to determine what is that actual damage category. If it's helpful to know, I know that the PDA unit is uh, working with the regions and they've been talking a lot about working with uh, state and local partners on exactly that developing um, formal training as well. That's awesome to hear. And it's interesting, you know, um, Daniel, you mentioned having kind of um, a visual quiz. I know FEMA does the same thing to ensure their analysts are also trained up using visual images of examples of destroyed major minor, which is another example of, you know, putting some training out there, making sure everyone is comfortable and doing um, what they need to do. So thank you for those great questions um, and for your amazing answers to our speakers. Um, I wanna move on because we have a few things left. And then um, what, as Kevin mentioned, our Q&A will get included in um, our session materials. So uh, we'll have anything that you all can answer in the remainder, that's fine. Otherwise we'll send this to our speakers and they'll, they'll have some homework <laughs> to get this to you all. Okay, so um, y'all see my slides okay? Perfect, all right. So gonna get going with our um, wrap up here. I'll try to keep it so that we continue to stay on time. Um, so uh, we have a few calls to action. If you've attended any of our events before, you know we like to give homework. So the first assignment uh, to steal from Jeff Barani with Esri, I think he might even be listening in, um, during a disaster is not the time to exchange business cards, he always says, which is absolutely true. So we wanted to start with a list of important folks to be sure you connect with. So I'll turn this over to Daniel, if you can speak to the first bullet in yellow. Yeah, I mean, knowing who's who in the zoo is probably the biggest component to all of this. Uh, we actually have an emergency management GIS contact list that I maintain here at the state with our partners to figure out who are the points of contact at the local level, who are the points of contact with our tribes, uh, federal, other state partners, if we're bringing in folks from emergency management assistance contact, so from out of state to help out. I know Joni mentioned something in chat there earlier. Um, but really kind of figuring out who are those relevant points of contact and also determining not just their you know, phone numbers, but ArcGIS Online usernames. Because we're implementing Arc Online for a lot of our stuff here, 
we're able to invite those users into our groups that we use to share content. And I posted something in chat to response on, I think something that uh, Jarrett had mentioned in there. Um, so really kind of figuring out who those people are, uh, build those relationships, both in blue sky and gray sky, because by going in gray sky, you're going to get everybody and their brother asking for information. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's that's been really key to us. Uh, knowing who's who is, is probably one of the biggest pieces to the puzzle here. Thank you. Um, and then next, I wanted to turn it over to Melody, um, kind of continue on the, uh, the good to know who's who in the zoo. Can you speak to the folks that um, you've shared with us here? Yes, yeah, so these are um, FEMA's identified regional PDA coordinators um, broken out by individual assessment, uh, individual assistance and public assistance. Um, and it's great to have um, the GIS regional folks, um, but I will tell you that our recovery folks access to GIS professionals varies from region to region. Some folks are, some regions have extraordinarily involved GIS people who are in on PDAs um, on a daily basis and creating you know, additional products for them even. And then other regions who don't really work with their GIS folks. So um, it's very important to make sure you can connect with these folks as well and, and probably ahead of time. And I know on our weekly uh, PDA calls, advisory group calls, um, all of the regions are so open and wanting to work with, with partners. So if you're the one to approach, they'd be thrilled too. <laughs> Thank you. That was a really good addition that I hadn't thought to include. So I appreciate you mentioning that. Um, next, I, I know Daniel, you kind of spoke at length uh, to your one-stop shop uh, of the hub, but um, considering there does seem to be quite a lot of resources uh, for folks who are gonna visit your hub, do you have kind of a, I would start here location? I mean, the main link is kind of where you're gonna go to find a, a, a fair amount of stuff out there, but certainly if, folks are more interested in kind of the back end, how we do this sort of stuff, feel free to reach out via email. I'm happy to, to share more information. Really, some of the very quick stuff that I can say is when you're designing a hub site, right, you start with kind of that public facing aspect, what things do you want to share out to the public? And then when you're looking at building out secured components of a hub page, all you got to do is build the page and then share that page to a specific group. So there are easy ways to be able to kind of make secured content accessible, make it out there that folks know and understand how to navigate to get this information. But really, when you're looking at building stuff like this, having a central spot that I only need to bookmark this URL to see what I need to see, it makes it a lot easier. We did run into one little trick, uh, and that's for jurisdictions that are outside of our organization. So we have the ArcGIS online organization. We can invite people from outside. When they sign in, they have to click a little link at the very bottom of the sign-in window to say, I'm signing in on my own account on Ar ArcGIS online, because otherwise there's that weird error. I'm gonna blame Esri for it. So Jeff, maybe you can take it back to your team. <laughs> It's not fair. We didn't um, make him a panelist, so he can't uh, defend himself. Or <laughs> um, okay, last one. And Melody, you already spoke to this, but um, I wanted to give you a chance to kind of share a little bit more about these resources. Yeah, these are all on FEMA.gov. Um, as I had mentioned, um, there are some you know, detailed instructions there. There are other resources on that page as well, including links to the damage assessment guides, the, the quick guide that, that Daniel referenced linking to, um, as well as the complete FEMA guide. Um, that is the, the place to start. Um, and I do wanna mention if you, your jurisdiction, your group, whatever you're a part of, decides to um, use the FEMA templates, want to put into in place your own solution so that you can stream 
streamline your process and get stream your data to FEMA, um, we are happy to help with that template. Um, we have worked with states, state representatives in the past. They get together with you know our technical GIS team, and we help them you know configure figure out um, what they should do. Um, we are in the process of cleaning up those templates a little bit, um, reconfigure or refactoring a few fields um, so that they are cleaner and more user friendly for states. Um, we got some excellent feedback from um, Tampa recently about ways that we can improve, which some we were aware of and some were very helpful and we'll be doing those. And so there may all, there may be a few more updates to the template, um, but again, we're, we're happy to help. Feel free to reach out to me um, or to your regional coordinator who can put you in touch with us and, and we're happy to help. Perfect. Um, yeah, so some of the resources that you shared um, were even new to some of us. So it's it's exciting to see that so many um, resources are available to help folks understand uh, submitting GIS data and that whole process. So I appreciate that you guys are continually updating that and making that available to everyone so they can, kind of like what we talked about with Dan, we'll just make sure that people can implement the tools. So appreciate that. Um, okay, so last thing, um, is I wanted to just let you all know that uh, you need to save the date for our next Inspire. Um, if you haven't been before, you can certainly visit our website, um, I have to close this window, uh, to get materials from previous years. It's a great opportunity for decision makers, first responders, technologists like GIS analysts to all come together. Um, it is free. So more to come on that. We certainly hope that you all will join us. Um, and then finally, just special thanks to our speakers today um, for generously giving your time, um, for innovating and pushing GIS to be this uh, amazing, useful tool across you know, so many things that uh, we do uh, as practitioners. Um, so thank you, Melody and Daniel, once again for uh, for contributing to this. I think it's been amazing and super informative. Um, this will be our wrap. The recording and slides and Q&A will be available in the coming days. So keep a lookout, everyone. Please take care. We hope to see you at a future prep tech talk. Um, if you're at Ezra UC, know that NAPSEG will be there. We hope to see you at our social. More to come on that as well. Um, with that, we will close it out. Thank you again, everyone, for your time and take care.